Sono Gianmarco Giuliana, che è un membro del FACET uh, ERC Project diretto da Massimo Leone, che è un membro in Bologna, quindi ho una responsabilità su questo, e poi ho venuto a Turin per il suo PhD, e ora è un postdoc, è mainly un esperto in game studies, ma uh, da un semiotico punto di vista che It's mainly connected to interaction and experience in some way. So it's not uh, only uh, the analysis of games, it's much more the experience and the interaction that are connected uh, also to embodied practice. So uh, I leave the floor to you. Uh, we have 30 minutes and then 15 minutes for Pascal. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Claudio, for the nice presentation and everyone for having me here. I'm very grateful and very happy. So the title of my presentation, as you can see, is Spaces from Within. Subjectivity and usages in DGVRs, which is digitally gamified virtual realities, which includes some games and some forms of virtual reality. Um, so, since the title of this uh, of this conference of this day of talk is the new challenges of cognitive visual semiotics, I would like to start also, like uh, Professor Abo, uh, we have a lot of things in common actually, with the provocation, which is the fact that a digital visage is not an image. And so this is the problem that I want to present to you uh, that we will see today to, to, together. And the first point is that image, of course, we use image in a lot of different ways, lots of metaphorical ways about what is an image. Um, but if you look at least from an etymological point of view, you need to have some form of representation of not pure presence. So this is going to be my problem to today. So, uh, a very important book by Professor Pinotti and Sumaini, uh, Theory del Immagine, here in Italian, uh, is interesting because uh, it, it would make very clear how easy it is for us to think that everything that we see is an image. So the quote is, as long as we are alive and we are psyche in a soma, our intelligible seeing comes through seeing, our spirit sees through the eyes of the body. This means it is not possible to think without images. This is a very interesting sentence because actually the logical conclusion of the first sentence should be it is not possible to think without seeing. It should not be that it is possible to think without images. So it is implied that everything that we see is an image. So this is going to be my, uh, my main focus. And why? Well, I've been faced uh, for two years. And in two years, I have studied any kind, let's say, more, almost any kind of digital representation of faces in virtual realities, in the metaverse. I have studied the problem of materiality, uh, the realism, the efficacy of these pictures, the practices of self-expression and self-representations in digital games. And after two years, I was thinking that something was, that I was missing something, but it was not something new, you know, not like a new case, a new case study, but something that I had in front of me that I couldn't see. And this thing is what I would call the visage in English, uh, which is a uh, from a linguistic point of view, problematic. So because of this, the distinction, of course, comes from mainly from the Italian, which we have the volto and the visage in the sense of viso, which is what you look at mainly, uh, differences from all the elements on the more complex aspect of the face. In English, perhaps we would talk about figure uh, differently from visage, which is sometimes the contents, but I don't want to lose time on semantic question. Uh, so the face is what you see, the visage is what you look at. The visage is the face from within that allows you to see and to be seen. The visage is not a point of view. It is a visual point of action. And this is going to be this is very interesting in the case of digital, uh, digital games and digital realities. So of course, there is a very interesting semantic aspect on the idea of viso, uh, which on the one hand, as you can see, it is like the problem of seeing yourself, of being able to make a testimony of what you're seeing. Uh, in, it is an idea of first-person reality in some sense, right? And, and the second one is that it cor completely corresponds with the idea of making, uh, of making an idea of something. So to make uh, a simple example, recognizing a face in Volto is a political act, saying this is a person. This is what we are witnessing with, for example, animalist movements, in which when you look at a cow, you see a face. Because this is a human being, it, it, it feels, it thinks, it is unique. You cannot kill something unique, right? Recognizing a visage is a pragmatic act saying we are chewing you. So if you ever have to, uh, <laughs> to avoid like a shark coming at you, you have to look at his visage. 
And of course, it doesn't matter if you have a mask, if you are blonde, your eyes, your mouth, your, the tight of your nose. None of these things matter. But this is what a visage is. So uh, this is this is very relevant in the study of digital games and in general, as uh, Professor Kojo was saying, of experience, because the, the uh, besides the, the the concrete case studies that that uh, I looked at in, the, in these two years in facets, I have always been like obsessed with the problem of truth of experience and of first person experience, of course, in digital games. As you know, there is this rhetoric that video games they are experiential, like if movies were not exploration or literature and so on. And so this idea of the correlation between the first person access to reality through the visage and this idea of digital visage uh, is, extremely, uh, is, is extremely close. So, um, what is a so why am I interested in visage? Because I am interested in first person effects of meaningfulness between representation and an action. And so, as always, in 2020, when we were making like the, this, this book, Meaning Making an Extended Reality, with uh, Federico Biggio and uh, Victoria dos Santos, I asked Claudio Polucci if he wanted to participate. And he gave me a paper in which the answer was there. And I was like, no, I shouldn't have asked him. You know, I, I could have tried, <laughs> but he gave me the answer right away. So, And his answer was that in, in virtual realities, you have this kind of hybridation of a logic of prosthesis and the logic of the simulacra, right, which comes together. And this is the theoretical ground, uh, but I would like to apply this on the specific case of digital visages. So these digital visages, they occur when the computational processing and mediation of the user's visions determines a sense of self-identity and self-presence in a virtual environment. This is due to a cognitive, uh, semi-cognitive participation between the subject outside the screen and its digitalized agentive presence, such as an avatar, but not necessarily one without the need of any narrative identification. This is not about being the character, right? It's not about being someone else. So that an empty position is created artificially and can be occupied by anyone, and anyone will feel this position as something personal. This is something, of course, very semiotics. So the difference with uh, looking at the visage from within, so these visages, of course, have eyes, but they may also have lids, eyelids, like in the case of this game for uh, that you can also play on your smartphones before your eyes, in which you have uh, your face is uh, your face is being red, and uh, fundamentally when you close your eyes, things are, are opening. For example, remember about your childhood, and so you close your eyes in reality, and pictures will change. When you open your eyes, you see pictures of childhood, and if you want to move away from something that you don't want to see, you close your eyes, and the pictures will move away. So this is a faces from within. In VR, another example of the face from within is the nose. What is the purpose of a nose from within? It is to help you to have direction. Many people felt motion sickness in virtual realities and because they, they had no idea. We are, no, we are not used to look without a nose. It is not possible for us, right? And so this is the point of a virtual nose from within. It is to help you to understand space and to move into space. Uh, so this, I would like to make something very clear that faces from within, they require interaction, but they are not reducible to a generic agency on images and stories. So you, we, you have no, uh, no kind of vi digital visages in, for example, Bandersnatch, right? You know, the, the Netflix movie, interactive movie. Uh, while uh, in this game designed for faces, for example, uh, one way to create a digital visage is to create a problem of truth, of what you have really seen. So you created this game, and all this game starts from something that you have to see that was in front of you, and then after the game asks you, do you remember this face, or was it, have you seen that? And you were like, oh, it was in front of me, I had seen that. You know, it's not like someone else, it's you have seen it, and you have to answer. So the meaningfulness of the visage does not rely on any chromatic, eidetic, or chromatic, uh, <laughs> topologic figure, sorry for the, for the mistake. <laughs> Its meaningfulness belongs to the cognitive habit for which we come to know the world. It is a premise more than a conclusion, a necessary guess about the subjectivity belonging to any image of a face. As such, the visage, in the sense in which I'm speaking of it, cannot be described. It is a threshold, a furnace between the subject's intangible identity and the elements presentifying it. 
So this view, of course, is very close to another author, which we, we, we often talk about Levinas, but we do not talk a lot about Sartre. And Sartre has exactly this more complex and more negative in some idea of the face. So uh, scholars interested in Sartre, um, in, in, in Sartre's idea of, um, of the visage, describe this in a very nice way. The visage it is the invisible visibility of the other subject through the gaze, right? And so the visa, from a semiotic point of view, I'm interested in that, not because I'm an expert on that, but because the visage is a device of objectifica objectification. This was the problem of Sartre. So I look at you and I'm objectifying you. I'm reducing your complexity as a subject, right? This was the problem of Sartre. Creating subjectivity from reflection. It is because I am objectifying you that I am myself a subject. So it is the visual and the cognitive mean through which the identity of the I is born differentially and topologically by looking at the heat. So this is what interests me as a semiotician on this view on such. So the visage is without a doubt an object of study related to meaning making for vision recognition. But can we really study it through a theory of images? That is my problem. So the first answer is that we cannot study it without a theory of images, <laughs> uh, especially uh, if we think of the modern way in which we think of images, of course, so that uh, if you think of the iconic term, for example, uh, gaze and sensorial perception, they are central, they are extremely important, right? And uh, of course, we do not need virtual realities to have your own gaze giving meaning to, uh, to a movie or to a painting like in Las Meninas and uh, many kinds of, uh, of movies and, and styles. So this is not the point. What interests me here is the, the fact that when we think of images, and even if we look at this description by Pinotti Tsumaini, we always think of, we almost always think of images as something that induces us to do things, to undergo things, right? The agentive action is from the outside. So a visage is exactly the opposite. So we could say that images, they do things with, on and from the spectator's gaze. Visages, they do things on images, images, and actually they make images. So the challenge of studying faces from within is not the problem of interaction with images. In Dentro Oswardo, Francesco Caizetti, for example, you completely like the idea that looking at the movie, depending on the debrayage and embrayage, you add moving. This is not the problem. And actually, when you study digital game, uh, this kind of theory, it, it does not work exactly because of the agentive nature of virtual reality. And it is not also, as I have explained, the problem of the agency of image themselves. It is the problem of a pragmatic intentionality and the mimetic indexicality on both seeing and looking at. So as an example, uh, faces from within, they are not the problem of first person shot or point of view shots, right? So this, in the, this movie, which became famous for its perspective, Outcome Airy, as a spectator, like you, you, you look where you may think that the character is looking. But as a player shooting, you are not looking, you are aiming. And aiming from a cognitive perspective is completely different than looking in the same direction. Similarly, in this shot of Robocop, in which everyone looks at, at, at the subject, right? So you may feel, you, 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 may, you may feel like, like, let's say, the protagonist in the sense that you feel that someone is seeing you, but certainly you are not seeing as, as a person, looked at as a person or even as an author because you're completely outside of the image and of the agentive power that you have on this image. So it was very interesting to see Pinotti talking about the destruction of the frame, because actually the very perception of a frame negates the subject by objectifying and restraining his or her gaze. The specificity of our visage is that I can look around and that nothing can frame, right? Uh, it, it, like, like in a movie or like in a painting, in my gaze. So the visage is not about seeing, it's about looking, willing, judging and doing. It implies a causal relationship between the subject and the object. It is not the part of the medium of the image. It is part and medium of situations and environments. Digital faces, like digital interfaces, are created to act and to be used in virtual realities. So another possible way to approach these kind of issues by a theory of image is, for example, the phenomenological way of seeing things in which you have the problem of the plane of projection, of looking through, of the subject and of the object, and so on. But there is a problem from the point of view of semiotics, of using phenomenological perspective, because still in 2021, phenomenology is claiming and defending the primacy of experience, while as a semiotician, 
and especially coming from a tradition such as uh, these books from Ruggiero Eugeni, uh, Cinematica di Media, our problem is like the study of construction and mediation of experience. So if you if you postulate the primacy, this becomes a problem. Um, so uh, I don't want to, to lose time uh, on, on this. This is the way in which I want, just wanted to show you in this digital games, Nia Automata, in which you are an Android, uh, a digital face is, is, is created by asking you, how oh, do you want to scream? Like, are, are you seeing well? They told to you if you're a robot, but you're actually just setting the options. You have no characters. It's just a black screen with questions, right? And then after, when you see right, when you have adjusted your vision as the ones of the Android, the, then you have the image of your character, you have the subjective one, and then you see your character in first person. So once again, you are not in first person, and yet this is your visage, this is your point of view, your agentive point of view on the image and on the world. So, and the last point, which is very important to me, is that digital visages, they're not about empathy. There is a lot of talking, especially about VR as the greatest empathy machines, and especially in psychology, there are a lot of important studies, like one from Herrera, uh, which, uh, which, which claims that there are proofs, evidences, that if you do something in VR, if you don't care about poor in real life, then I put you in VR, and then you will care about poor in real life. So, of course, uh, I have already written like many critiques about this kind of view, but I would like to, to stress out another thing here. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. This was a psychology accusing. <laughs> so the point is that if you want empathy, like a lot of theory of the, of, of the modern theory of images was based on like theories like mirror neurons and so on, uh, which was really the point of like, you know, having empathy with something that you see. In a digital visage, you never see the visage of your character. So actually you do not have empathy. This is extremely interesting. So I would say that digital visages, they are multimodal constructs of meaning, depending as much on narration in general term language as on vision, and are rooted in pragmatic acts of objectivation for intentional and indexical agency. Digital visages, they are semiotic machines and processes creating intersubjective forms of first-person experience through vision. Uh, so to conclude my, my presentation, I, I had two, two roles. So the first one was to show you, make a showcase, or all the way in which on of the computational aspects of digital visages, like for example, transparency, controlling your camera, and of course <laughs> the, the tracking of your uh, movement, very personal fear and intimacy, the fact that you uh, that your brain actually sees something coming close at you, right? Staring in this game in the in the bottom right, Galgan, you can stare at a girl and she will follow you with love. So you just have to stare at her. And and, and this has an effect on the world. And of course, you have a lot of face reading technologies. But I'm not really interested in doing that. I want to explain you why I care about actually uh, digital visages. And um, about the question, can you really experience a sense of self and of otherness by gazing through a digital visage? If so, how and why? So this is in, an, an important question, socially speaking, for two reasons. First of all, we are having and seeing a lot of products which are trying to have, let's say, a kind of historical impact on education by putting the, by, by putting the, the, the viewer in the eyes, in the face of historical, of historical uh, let's say, uh, figures and, and moments. So this is, for example, I am Jesus Christ and Apollo 11 and beyond. And so, as I was telling you, if you want to feel sorry for Christ, if you want to understand the pain, if you want to, to have a sense of belief, you do not go in, I am Jesus Christ, you family we are. You look at the movie. You look at the, at the suffering face. From a cognitive point of view, it is, of course, a lot better if, if you really want to have like this kind of you know, like effect. So the point of Jesus VR is not to have the player share Jesus' perspective in the complex sense of perspective, which would entail knowing and sharing his entire mindset. This is completely impossible. Instead, it is to have the player recognizing Jesus' position as his own. It is a rhetoric of perceptive appropriation of austerity. And this is also important for scientific projects about health. Uh, this is, uh, so you have, in VR, you have, for example, simulator of autism, which claims that they want you to understand, to better understand what it is like to perceive the world uh, as something, uh, as someone which has this, uh, this, this issue. Uh, and a very important and interesting case studies is the, 
the Freud uh, case, I don't know if you know about it, by this very famous study about uh, from Slater or from 2019. So the idea was that as a patient, you would be created as an avatar, as a realistically looking avatar. And, uh, and you speak in front of, uh, in VR, in front of a virtual Freud, and you explain your problems, right? So what is, what is wrong? Why are you sick? Why are you sad? And so on. And then after a while, the perspective shifts. And you become Freud, and you see yourself, and you see your face, and you see yourself talking to yourself and explaining your problems to yourself. And you have to give an advice to yourself. And what is amazing is that it was demonstrated that this is actually works. So there are two. Yeah. Because they had this theory of mind problem, uh, they cannot put into the point of view of the other. Exactly, so exactly. So here we have two. We have to distinguish two ideas of otherness. There is a strong version, which is being, feeling, and seeing like someone else. And I would deny that digital games and virtual realities have, have this power. Actually, I think that literature and movies and paintings have a much stronger possibility of doing that. But I think that there is a weak version, which is kind of unique of virtual reality and digital games, which is the possibility of experiencing an equivalent alteration in being feeling and thinking. And so right now, this is a work in progress. Um, I don't know about how much time I, I have left, but uh, yeah, still more than five minutes. More than five minutes, perfect. So I am extremely interested in all the digital games, which both VR, non-VR, for different media, working with blindness. There is a great interest for players to, to experience blindness. Um, and this is quite interesting because how do you experience blindness in a virtual reality or in a game, which is something, of course, that you can, cannot do in, in any ways? So it is not about the fact that, as you can see from these pictures, you know, like the reality, different colors, you know, of course, the sounds and so on. But it is through agency. So I have tried, the, the, I, have, I have to study the other games, but I've tried Perception, which is, by the way, a very scary game, so it's very hard for me to study that, but I'm trying. <laughs> And so in perception, you are this blind woman you know, in a house, of course, with ghosts and monsters, and you have to use a stick right, to make resonate things that you can see around you. But the point is that because of the gameplay rules, when you use the sticks, the monsters come close. So at some point, from the cognitive point of view, you cannot use your stick. You cannot use your real eyes as a player. And so you have to think, where was this thing? How should I grab this item? So you are basically adopting a completely different mindset because you are moving in the dark, you are acting in the dark with different senses, a different sense of memory, of space, and of action. And this is quite interesting because, as you can see, it is not about the image, it's about the acting on the image. And so to conclude, I am really interested in, in, the, in this topic of visages because as Claudio Paolucci in this uh, in his cognitive semiotics wrote, like it is really a, a different way, I think, to prove that uh, the, the high is really constituted by the he and not by the, the ego like we knew. I am saying that because, as we can see in all these cases, uh, the, the idea is that subjectivity is made of multiple possibilities. So this is the, the fact, this is the, the true art of the, the idea of the E of the I, right? Is that I am not only myself, I cannot only speak for myself. This, this is not how identity works, or subjectivity works. But still, when you think of our identity, it is really defined by how the object in front of us defines, right, the subjects that we are. And so by changing the way in which I as a subject perceive objects, I experience a different version of myself, a different cognitive version, a different, and all this is done mainly for vision. So I experience possibilities. This is the real interest of semiotics from my point of view, of experiences of the virtual, that I can experience a different I. I can discover all the E inside myself that were somehow uh, impossible for me to grasp in my normal perception of life and of the other. And so I think this is both from a theoretical point of view as a social point of view, an extremely interesting uh, object of study. And I thank you very much for your attention.